Hi, this is Erika Kasab from A Small Robot Studio. Today I want to talk about my experience sculpting in Blender and how it compares to Nomad Sculpt. I use Blender regularly for box modeling and rendering, but I had never completed a sculpt only in it. Let me start with the positives, what I enjoyed about it. As an artist, you must be careful with tunnel vision. Digital art makes it super easy to zoom in and forget about what is outside the screen, losing track of the big picture. What looks good in a detailed view may not work when you zoom out. For this reason, I love that in Blender I can set up two different windows with independent cameras. There is one where I am working and one more where I can see the complete sculpt with the changes I'm making in real time. You can save different cameras in Nomad, but only see one at a time. This is a massive win for Blender, because not even ZBrush is able to do that, at least at the time of this recording. Moving on, I love Royal Sky's analogy that Blender is the Swiss knife of 3D software. It gives you all the tools necessary for a full 3D production. Nomad is only one of these many tools. The advantage of having all this available is that I don't need to export and switch software to retopologize, animate, or even make simulations. I especially enjoy having access to box modeling tools, where I can control any vertex, edge, and face in it. In other words, I have full control over the topology. Sculpting is not the same, because you are molding an existing mesh by moving many vertices at the same time. You may recalculate the topology, but you don't control exactly the flow of an edge. Box modeling is great to sculpt inorganic objects, like glasses, jewelry, or any accessory the character may carry. But tools like Polybuild are also great to create elements like eyebrows, lashes, or clothing. This is simply not possible in Nomad, which is only specialized in sculpting. If you aim to be a professional artist, you must learn non-destructive workflows. Normally, every change we make means that a previous step gets deleted from the undo history. Sure, I can go back several steps, but as soon as I make a new change, the work ahead is overwritten. This is known as linear or destructive workflow. Blender has a bunch of non-destructive tools known as modifiers. For instance, the Solidify modifier will add thickness to a plane like the one I made for the eyebrows. I can easily edit the shape to enhance it, and if I decide the thickness is not right, I can adjust the value, turn it off temporarily, or completely erasing. In a destructive workflow, I would have to undo a bunch of times, change the thickness, and redo my modifications, if I didn't run out of undos. Nomad has some equivalent tools, like the mirror repeater, but Blender offers many more. Blender also beats Nomad when it comes to curve-based functionalities. Curves are lines in 3D space that have no thickness. These are not visible to render, but we use them to build meshes and make our life easier. You may have experience when sculpting, trying to do a stroke, and you have to do it over and over again, because your hand shakes or it will simply not go in the right direction. With a curve, we can establish the direction and do any tweaking before committing to it. This lets me do very controlled strokes with little effort. An even cooler example of curves functionality is using them to create hair. I will not go into details on the steps because there are already great tutorials about it, like the one that JanSculpt made. In short, you use one curve that follows the direction of the hair and another one that establishes the shape of the strand. This is my favorite way to create stylized hair. I'll often bring my sculpts from Nomad or even ZBrush just to use this tool. You can have as much variety as you want by creating several profile curves. And you can modify them non-destructively. Nomad has a few tools which work with curves but the functionality is limited compared to Blender. To get the best out of sculpting in Blender, I absolutely recommend using a tablet. So let's talk about it. XP10 reached out to us to try one of their display tablets. 
the Artist 13 second generation, as you can see here. So what did you think of it? I really liked it. I really couldn't tell any difference from all the other major brands which we are experienced with. It's a very nice size, very portable. Uh, it, the responsiveness is great. Yep, it's got a nice little pen. Um, it's got all your hotkeys there. And it's yeah, really nice and responsive. It's got a brand new chip in it, X3 chip. I don't know what that does. Sounds fancy. <laughs> it sounds fancy. It's got full featured USB-C input output there, which will do your display and the data if the computer or Mac you're using uh, supports it, so check that. If your computer doesn't support full featured USB-C, you can run it from uh, the output to a two USB and HDMI output, which is really simple to set up. It's what I'm using on this computer behind me. Probably the best about this tablet is the price. The recommended retail price is 300 US dollars. So check the link below though, because there may be some special pricing going on now and it will be different in your different locations, obviously. If you are looking at this and you're comparing it to something like an iPad, what does that comparison actually look like? A new iPad with the Apple Pencil is roughly about 1200 US dollars. So that's 2,500 New Zealand dollars. With that money, I could buy a gaming PC plus the display tablet. We get in university lots of students that bring their iPads and it's not the best because they cannot plug them to the computers that we use and use the software that we are learning. Yeah, when you can't run ZBrush, you can't run Blender on an iPad, I don't believe. You can't run a whole bunch of the software that you're going to use if you're doing something like animation. So it's a lot more versatile to get a decent PC or a laptop. And this display tablet, it's nice and light so you can take it into school and you're going to be a lot better off. As much as I love to sculpt in the iPad, for professional work, you will need a PC. So you really like Nomad. Um, is that on PC? You can actually run it. Uh, there is a demo version which works with any browser. So if you want to see what that is like, I'm going to do a live stream where I'll be using Nomad on the browser plus the XP pin. And we'll put a premiere up on the channel so you can uh, see when that's going to be released uh, or when we're going to run that live stream. That should be in the next couple of weeks, probably on the weekend because that's when we're not at work. Yeah. Thanks XP pin for supporting us on this video. Let's go back to Nomad and Blender. So far, it has been rainbows and kittens with Blender, but I will be honest. Against Nomad and ZBrush 2, Blender is my least favorite tool for sculpting. You know how I mentioned that Blender is a Swiss knife that can do it all? Well, that doesn't mean that every tool is the best at what it does. This too can unscrew a cork, but one will make it easier and faster. Which will you prefer if you had to unscrew a hundred corks in one day? Nomad is the specialized tool for sculpting. To me, its brushes react more naturally. Blender felt clunky. The responsiveness and feel was inconsistent between brushes. Some were okay, but others felt just weird. Some of the behavior was also unexpected and not compatible with tools that had the same name in either Nomad or ZBrush. I found it frustrating and difficult to control them even after watching tutorials about them. The brushes and their modifiers are very visible and in theory accessible in the UI or through hotkeys. But I found myself wasting lots of time navigating the screen trying to find what I needed. I can't even move the brushes I use the most to the top for easy access. I get it, navigating a software gets easier with practice, but even after hours and days into the project, I felt this way. I am already a Blender user, and I do 3D art for a living. If the learning curve was painful for me, I can only imagine how difficult it would be for a beginner. The sculpting process felt constantly interrupted by technical operations. An example is adding a mesh to the scene. I have to get out of the sculpting mode, insert a new primitive, move it where I need it, and go back to sculpting mode. Way too much clicking around. Have you ever used the insert brush in Nomad? It takes half a second. This makes Blender far from ideal for rapid iteration. 
concept art requires exploring lots of ideas by creating lots of options, fast. I don't know about you, but as soon as I get distracted, my ideas flee my mind. As a professional creative, I cannot afford this waste. Adding primitives was annoying, but the true pain was managing different objects. In Nomad, I simply tap on the mesh I want to sculpt and work on it. However, in Blender, I will have to hit over the outliner and click in this specific small area to activate that object. If I click on the wrong place, it might throw me out of sculpt mode. The most frustrating thing is that object mode actually lets me click and modify an object right away. My model is a simple bust with a few pieces. Imagine the pain in a project with more than a dozen meshes. While Blender has lots of non-destructive modifiers, it is missing a standard and essential tool for sculpting software. Layers. Layers can store shape changes, sculpted details, and even colors. This can be partially erased, its intensity adjusted, or they can be completely turned off. Layers are great for sculpting surface detail without messing up the base, among many other uses. To be fair, it is possible to buy an add-on which gives you that functionality in Blender. Most of it, at least. But this add-on is 22 US dollars, while Nomad is 15. My final complaint is towards the lag with high resolution meshes. My computer is a spec for high performance with 3D software, yet I experienced Blender getting sluggish when I went over 200k polygons. In Nomad, I sculpt meshes of more than 3 million polygons, using a first generation iPad that is now more than 4 years old. In Blender I tested working with multi-resolution, voxel remeshing, and dynamic topology. I went through tutorials that offer ways around, but the lag was never fully gone. 200k is not an impressive number, and my computer is way more powerful than the little iPad. Troubleshooting was again distracting me from sculpting. My experience with Blender was full of unexpected behaviors, for which I had to find workarounds that often meant changing my workflow. Problems that wouldn't even cross my mind with Nomad. So, there you go. Plenty of positives for Blender, but nothing is perfect. The reality is that as a professional game artist, I jump between multiple programs based on which is the best at a given task. I would love to hear about your experience, and I want to thank once again XPPen for sponsoring this video. I'll see you soon in a new tutorial. Happy sculpting! That's it for this tutorial. If you find it useful, make sure that you leave a like so other people can find it. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe as we are bringing out CG and illustration tutorials every week. Become a patron and access tutorial assets, bonus content, a private discord and more by clicking in the link below.